When we boil down making games to just a few simple high level steps, it's quite easy. First thing you do is you get your killer game idea, something that you think is gonna be really fun and that a player will enjoy to play. Then you take that idea, shove it into an engine and make the actual game. And the last difficult part is marketing your game and making sure that other people will actually start playing what you think is fun. Of course, shoving your idea into an actual engine, making it a completely playable game and marketing it is not as simple and can sometimes take months or even years. But I wanna sit down in this video and talk a bit more about that first part, getting that killer game idea or getting that fun idea. So if you're about to embark on a new journey as a game developer and you're looking for inspiration for a new idea or you wanna dissect an existing idea you already have, be sure to stick around and watch this video. Now, recently I was researching that first part, getting that game idea and trying to figure out what makes a good game idea. And there's a lot of research I've been doing, a lot of different ways that you can go around making a new game idea. We already made an older video about it, but I don't really know if it's the best one anymore. But the main question I have is, what is a fun game? Because fun is one of those dangerous words for a game developer. You always wanna go for a fun experience but once you try to actually describe fun, it's really hard because fun is also different for me than how it is for you. Fun for some people may be just losing 10 games in a row in League of Legends and being destroyed whilst your entire team is raging upon you. Or fun could be something like a very slow walking simulator game where you're more getting the experiences of your surroundings or it could be any other thing really. And as a designer, it's very hard to figure out what kind of fun you want to make for your player, what kind of fun there should be in your game. And there was this one thing that I came across in my research, which is called the MDA framework. MDA stands for Mechanics, Dynamics and Aesthetics. And it's a research paper really that's almost 20 years old at this point, it's written in 2004, it's quite short. And I took a look through it and honestly, I don't really like it that much. Their aim is to take the concept of fun and they break it down into mechanics, dynamics and aesthetics, which all combined make that kind of fun feeling. And I took a look at it, but I didn't really like it. So I kept on looking at more stuff, but I kept finding it back. And I don't think the paper itself is really great. I've linked it down below if you want to take a look at it, but I think it talks almost too high level and also too advanced at the same time. It's like peak thesis stuff basically, or I'm too stupid to understand it, which in my case makes it useless. But what I did start work on this, I did read it and I did combine it with some other sources. And I think that the MDA framework is actually a quite good way to dissect the game and see what makes it fun, what makes it a good game. So I want to sit down and share with you guys basically what does it all mean? What does the mechanics mean, the dynamics and the aesthetics? And how can you apply it to your own games that you're making? And the first thing that they define is the mechanics. This is what you can influence the most as the game developer or game designer. And that is, what are the actual rules of your game? How does your movement system work? Are there physics? Is it a platform where you are able to push things? Maybe you're simulating an entire advanced alien political system in a game like Stellaris, for example. These are things that you most likely have to program, actually write down the code for. To, in order to define how your game is going to be played. So in our case, in our game Forge Industry, we're very mechanics focused. So we have all of our different workstations and they all have set rules of, okay, if you put planks into a wood saw, it will always make rods or something like that. Those are very hardcore defined mechanics almost. And these form the base of your game. But those are just surface level mechanics. What I also want to talk about is they can go deeper. And one really good example of mechanics that aren't really obvious to the player if they don't really look at it, is something like character AI or NPC AI. So I really like, for, for example, in Half-Life 2, you have the Combine AI. A lot of people think Half-Life 2 was revolutionary because it was fully physics-based, but I think that the Combine AI, because it's not as visual, because you get a gravity gun, which is really in your face about physics is the core of this game, the AI is also something really special. This is something that the developers at Valve really put a lot of thought in because they actually designed the AI to work together to make it feel harder. They will alternate shooting at you whilst the other combine soldiers are reloading or they'll try to get you out of your hiding places by using grenades and things like that. And a normal player will probably just think that the AI is a bit harder, but they won't really sit down and notice, oh, 
they're actually working against me in a more advanced way. Valve is really good at this kind of stuff. Also with Left 4 Dead they have this AI system where they try to calculate the distress that a player is in to always keep the stress level at a high level. So your mechanics are really important because the following next two steps, the dynamics and the aesthetics, they all trickle down from it. So it's really worth it to spend some time and figuring out in do I have any unique mechanics or what should I form my mechanics to really have something cool for my player to experience. Next up, we get the dynamics. If you're a developer, the easiest way to explain this is this is the, what your player decides to do at runtime. So this is what the actual player is doing, the dynamically changing part. Your rules, your mechanics, they are set. And you as a player, you can't change it. You can't suddenly run faster than what the developer has intended you to run at, or you can't jump high, or you can't do things that the developer has not programmed in the game. What you can do, however, is work around those mechanics, work around those rules, and figure out new ways to do things with the rule set that you've been given. If we go back to the idea of our combine AI, the way the AI works is the mechanic, but the dynamic is actually how you as a player interact with that. So do you just go in guns blazing and just hope that you kill everyone before they kill you? Or do you try to be more tactful and go as far away as possible from them in order to have more safe distance or whatever? Or maybe you try and wait them out and pick them off one by one. This is how you interact dynamically with the mechanics that have been given to you by the game. These things are a lot harder to plan as a developer. That's the real struggle we always have. These are very much more impactful in defining what is fun. And you can only see these dynamics really come into play once you're playtesting your games. And this is something that I always struggle a bit with, and you probably as a game developer as well, is when you're showcasing your game to someone else and you have been playing on this game for the past months or whatever, you've literally written the game and you know there is a best way to do everything. So you can almost speed run your game. And then you give your game to someone who has never played it before and you just melt down basically as they're just trying to do basic things such as moving the character or drawing a road in our case. And you're just sitting there like, how can you not understand it? That's because there are so many different ways to do something dynamically and it's really hard for us to plan those things. We actually just need to test them. Another example of how these dynamics can work is if you look at speedrunners. An example of that is in GTA 5. There is this trick that if your car goes up from a little curb down, it gives your car just the tiniest bit of a speed boost. Something that developers have never really thought about, that this would Im impact how the game is being played. Yet some guy was speedrunning the game, finding out a new dynamic to play the game and figure out that, hey, I go 2% faster and suddenly everyone is doing the little getting off and on the curbs. And these are things that are very hard to plan, but actually offer some fun for the player because they feel the reward of almost breaking out of the predefined rule set. And as we're talking about player interaction with your game, balancing also becomes really important, especially in something like an online game where you're playing against other people. Balancing can be one of the hardest things. Take, for example, League of Legends, where you have hundreds of champions. Well, you as a developer need to figure out a balanced way that makes sure that no matter how people play, whether they're really good at a champion and like fully know the ins and outs, there's not just a single best champion. You can maybe get better with a certain champion, but there shouldn't be a mechanical advantage. There shouldn't be a rule set or a way that the rules can be used that is just completely overpowered against all the other characters. But I haven't really said much about the game genre or setting or story or any of those things. Those are actually the least important part of your game, usually, unless you're making something that's really just driven on more telling a story. Your aesthetics is what your player is actually feeling. And the name aesthetics makes you think, no, it's just how my game looks. Is it 2D? Is it 3D? Is it pixel art? Whatever. But what I mean really is how do they feel it? How do you feel your game? How do they see your game? How do they hear your game? And what do they feel emotion-wise from your game? And this can be the most important part almost because the aesthetics part is what will leave a lasting impact for your game. You can have a game that maybe mechanically is nothing new, there's not any new ground being broken, but just by having a really good story or a really good soundtrack or the visual style is just this special thing, you can really give a lasting impression to the player. I think one example of this is the game Cruelty Squad, which mechanically is a shooter game, nothing too special about it, but they really mastered the aesthetics part. 
because if you just look at it on first glance, it looks like absolute garbage. Um, that it's good again almost, that it makes sense in this twisted world or how the graphics, how no sane developer could ever make graphics this ugly almost, helps in making that impression in how they change the controls up, that it just doesn't make sense and you have to rewire your brain. These things will make sure that you will remember the game. And hey, it worked. I'm still talking about the game right now, even though I played it like a year ago. So the aesthetics part is really where you define what feelings do I want to give from the player. And in the MDA framework, in the paper, they also link the aesthetics as the part that links the most to fun. Because fun is a feeling and the aesthetics point is to feel something. So what do you do as a developer? Well, I would start by actually defining the feeling you want your game to have. Do you want your game to be more of a slow and emotional game where you maybe have to deal with feelings of sadness and grief? Or do you want to have it something that's more fast paced and more action and feel good? Well, you want to make sure that those feelings correspond with your actual aesthetics. Do you have more dramatic minor key songs? Do you have a more muted co color palette, for example. And is your world maybe simply just not as vibrant and alive almost? Are the people in your world also just more depressed almost in general? These are things that you need to figure out before you start working on your game. Okay, so I just explained what it all is. Now I quickly wanna go over what you should do in the different stages of developing your own game and where the MDA framework comes in. Obviously, design is the biggest one. When you're designing your game, you'll probably have your idea. And the first thing that I would do is figure out what is going to be my main pillar. Am I a mechanically focused game, like what we have in our case? Am I a dynamically focused game? So more something like that's online maybe, where you play against other people and the dynamics are really important? Or am I an aesthetically focused game where it's more about the story, for example, or the emotions that your game should bring up? And this should be the pillar basically for your entire game that you spend the most time on. Not that the other two pillars aren't important, but I think you shouldn't reinvent the wheel everywhere. I think you should focus on one pillar and use that to make you unique. And then the other two keep it somewhat generic almost, could get basic and really focus on this one thing where you're making yourself special. If you're making yourself unique in all different aspects, well, then it becomes a lot harder for a player to immediately vibe with your game because it's something so completely foreign to them often. Next up, we get to testing our game. Now, testing is where your dynamics will really shine true because up until the actual testing of your game, like I said before, there's no way to guarantee whether your game is actually fun or not. So you want to know as fast as possible if your game is actually an enjoyable experience, really. Is it really fun to play? And will people really want to play it to begin with? If the answer is no, well, you want to know this information as fast as possible so you can either pivot to something that the players will like. Maybe you'll have to change up some of the mechanics or if it's really just no one really likes it, it's better to quit a game as early as possible to stop working on it and to just scrap it all and try something new. Very critical that your dynamics are good and that it's fun. And this you can only find out through playtesting. And then lastly, we have the marketing part. And the marketing part, why would you have your MDA framework? Well, what makes your game so fun and so nice is also what you would use to sell it. So this is a bit similar to how you use a game design document that you've written before, how you use it to source your marketing material. So what kind of feeling maybe does your game have? Well, you want to have that cohesive with your marketing. You don't want to have a dark game and that's like more horror based and then have a very vibrant and like cutesy aesthetic. Unless maybe your horror game takes place in a kindergarten, which could take, make sense. But generally you want to have the two still be cohesive. So it's not how your game only feels, but also how everything surrounding your game feels. Also stuff like your trailers, for example, you need to invoke that same feeling. And what's also important is what's your mechanics and dynamics can often be used as some of, you know, those quotes of why you should play the game because it has engaging combat or you have 64 people online battles or whatever. Similar to a game design document, these things you can just pluck out of your MDA framework that you've written before and then just put it on like a poster or whatever and you're done. So that's in summary what the MDA framework is. Again, I'll have it linked down below. You can go and take a look about it. I don't really love the interpretation the most. It's a bit outdated and very dense and academic. But if you want, I think you can still go and take a look at it as it really covers some parts even a bit deeper still. 
And I think the best way for you to actually go and put what you've learned in this video into action is to apply or maybe dissect the MDA framework onto some games that you like. So you can take a game that you really like, for example, you really like a game such as Doom Eternal in my case, and you take the MDA framework and you split it up. What are the mechanics of Doom Eternal? So for example, you have the grappling hook, hook shotgun, or you have the dashes, or you have the fast movement. Then you have the dynamics, which is what are the different ways to go into combat. And then you have the aesthetics, which is things like the music, how it looks, how it feels, how fast it is. And you can break these things down and really write down line by line, basically, of these are the exact ingredients that make a Doom Eternal. If I have another game with these exact ingredients, it will feel very similar to a Doom Eternal. And by doing this exercise, you really get a better understanding of how do I structure this framework and how can I apply it to my own game? What do I want in my own game? to be the mechanics, the dynamics, and the aesthetics. And that's about all I have for this video. If you're new here, we're a small indie game studio that are working on our own game for its industry, which you can wishlist down below. We'll be releasing soon. And we also make two videos a week um, with game dev related content such as this, where we talk about various things. We go and we do some vlogs, some behind the scenes, or we talk about more of the design aspects, some business aspects, whatever. So if you're an indie developer or you're just interested in the world of indie development, be sure and go and subscribe down below as it really helps us out and you get these cool videos twice a week. That's all I have for this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.